Hi there. I'm going to talk to you about your future as a designer. Let's see if I can actually get this to behave. Oof. Yeah, there we are. All right, maybe I have to stand close enough. Uh, yeah, so um, you all are designers, and I assume most of you are designers. Um, like myself as a designer, we have been in this industry essentially upgrading the past. Even the most modern tools that we spend most of our time designing for are essentially tools. They're upgrades of this very basic idea of I use this external thing, this external affordance to improve part of my life, to communicate with others, to connect with others, to make the world around me better. And the design language we use is, in a lot of ways, dragged from the past, brought forward and upgraded, made better, uh, even though we start to see underneath that some things that are fundamentally different, right? We move forward the idea of traditional maps into new digital maps, but that third screen shows sort of cracks in this idea, the idea that the third screen is actually helping me make that decision. And this is where I'm gonna go. We've spent an industry's uh, a lifespan on software and tools and designs that are about people, places, and things. And that's a really key idea about those things. What I want to introduce you to is a future that I believe is design that is in and of people, places, and things. And also, I think we got to talk about this a little earlier, um, from information that's moved around, that's shared about the world, to information that's essentially synthesized, that is created in this newer modality. Most profoundly, it's a future where any question, any subject, from anywhere will be representative of the kind of experiences people expect and people become used to and will be the sort of the stage from which you design. To give you a simple example of that, we've seen Barbie just a few minutes ago, right? Barbie's actually a pretty funny subject. Um, and honestly, this product is really an outright failure, um, not only for the reasons described earlier, but also just because it doesn't work that well. But to me, it's also a really good example. What do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a scientist. Oh, wait a minute. I want to be a scientist. Eureka! A scientist. I think science is so amazing. Why do you want to be a scientist? Uh, I always really liked chemistry and physics in school. The study of physics is incredible. Take gravity. You can't see okay. it, but the second you trip... Kind of creepy, <laughs> but also profound. We have an ordinary toy that now is an intelligent thing. So it's an animate, a normal thing in our life that's, you know, and I use the word tool very liberally. It was a tool, a tool for play. But now this tool has its own disposition. It is animate in new ways. We're also inventing these new sort of pylons that we're putting throughout our homes and coming up with more and more instruments like this that don't have any historical precedent. They don't have historical analogies. They're just talking machines, machines that are black boxes to a vast uh, number of possibilities. And I think one of the things most profound to me about that is that we're a little confused about what it is we're doing. Are we making a future it? Or is it, um, like my children, they, they really think of it as her. Alexa is a her. Not an it, but a new kind of character. Not, a, not an equal character to the dog uh, or to their brother or sister, but a true character. Voice, by the way, is a super interesting uh, subject. And one of the most interesting things about it is this idea of who or what am I talking to. Right now, there's only three major brands uh, that we 
essentially talk to. There's Siri, there's Google, and there's now Amazon. But this idea won't sustain, right? We are going to get into a much broader architectural question of who or what am I talking to? And that question looks a little bit like this. It begins with, am I talking to myself? Am I really, do I have a digital self that I'm talking to? Am I talking to the sort of the classical Siri? Uh, am I talking to this, uh, a more specific brain, uh, like Watson? Uh, or am I talking to one of the particular brands? Also, in terms of just the directionality, the, the object nature of it, since we really like to trust objects rather than this sort of virtual uh, god in the, in the moment. Am I talking to the box of Cheerios? You know, I pick up, I'm sitting there at breakfast, and I pick up an object, and you have to trust that the cost of these technologies gets to the point where this is a practical possibility, that the box of Cheerios could answer back. So it, it, is, it becomes sort of a, a necessary question. Would I want to talk to my box of Cheerios? Or would I maybe instead want to talk to the appliances in the room, talk to a dedicated Echo, maybe talk to my refrigerator, or even better, do I want to talk to the room around me or maybe the greater construct of the home? These, these questions become super interesting to me when I look at the future of design and the kind of problems we're solving. Character is also super important. I don't need that sound. But I want you to watch this. This is a, a Stanford experiment where they animated a trash can. And it's fascinating how people bring a sense of personality to a device when it becomes animate. Animate in even only the most simplistic manner. So here, people are basically saying, no, I don't have anything for you. Yeah, here's a little kid trying to uh, treat it like a dog, basically <laughs> bringing the character along, bringing the trash can along. It's a fantastic video. You should look it up. Sorry, I didn't put the URL on the screen. It, it goes on much longer, and I probably won't allow it the whole uh, uh, time. But uh, it's the simple point is we're entering into a phenomena where the things we design, and I'm very interested in three-dimensional things as much as I am software, the things we design are becoming um, not simply tools that sit to the side of us. They become animate like another one of us. It's also true that our spaces become a design question. We think of spaces as sort of this passive element to it. Unless you're an architect actively designing, this is, a, this is a Central Park in New York City. And what's going on, the mad dash here, is they're playing Pokemon Go. <laughs> and someone's discovered a really precious Pokemon somewhere in the park. And this phenomena happened. So this is a virtual space overlaid onto real space. And it's the virtual nature of that space that created a very real stampede. There's another clip I didn't bring from Tokyo where a whole crowd of people ended up in the middle of very, very busy traffic in a very dangerous situation because there was a virtual object in the middle of that very real traffic. One of the things about space that uh, is incredibly attractive to me and the studio uh, I work in is this idea of bringing the space to life, essentially bringing the computing moment into the spaces around us. We call this idea interactive light, and we spent quite a bit of effort researching and exploring that. And it's simply because this idea, whoop, this idea, is really sexy. I want this, right? I want this to be my future in user interface design, user experience design, but it doesn't seem to work yet. And the closest thing is this. And I don't want that, right? Pretty easy. So I also believe in this very profound idea of dark interactions. And what that means is Think of what you do through the course of a day interacting with any problem set. 
and then try and account for the moments where you touch the meaningful affordances that were designed to help you with that. Typically, like, let's say a piece of software. There are a thorough number of interactions in that process that the software didn't take part in. It was just essentially out of scope, unaware, uninvolved. There wasn't a tool for it. I want to use the larger sphere of space to capture as much of those dark interactions as possible. And like dark data, if you look at the idea of dark data, it allows a system to in engender far more context and therefore potentially be far more helpful to the moment. So I look at the, the problem and I see that there are lots of ideas around smart things. But also what's really exciting is the possibility of bringing into the problem a whole range of dumb things because there are far more of those and I don't want to manage the batteries and the Wi-Fi connection and the configuration of all those smart things. What I want is a smart world of dumb things, smart dumb things. So simple ideas like this, we have built quick little prototypes for, and I better turn on the sound. Oop. Okay, so I want a light switch. There's not a light switch on that wall. So I'm gonna take and make a dumb thing smart with just a very simple interaction. Give me a second to draw. Computer, light switch. All right, very simple interaction, right? But it's convincing. So, oh man, I gotta get, get this slides down. Uh, I want a volume knob, because the stereo's way back behind me. So I want to basically assign an arbitrary object volume control. These are smart, dumb things. This is using the space around me for new interactive possibilities. So here's where we get to interactive light. And again, I'm going to turn off the volume there. We believe in the idea of projection into space will allow us this sort of heads-up view of the world that augmented reality promises without the ridiculous goggles. So we built a simple prototype to start with, really simple, Pong. Everybody knows how to play Pong but we wanted to basically solve a lot of the fundamental problems of involving light, which is you know projected GUIs, and physical spaces into one system. <laughs> Turns out lots of beautiful possibilities. People love playing with this table. We learned a ton from this, and so we started doing some other things, trying to figure out, okay, we want to write some real applications here. So simple things like using the surface that we're cooking. So we're in the kitchen, our hands are dirty, and we want to be able to manage a recipe. So we want to be able to project in space. Now we're dealing with limited resolution, so we did things kind of big. Uh, so it's a little bit brutal at this stage, but it does the job. It shows us that we can work with a computer without having a computer with us in the sort of literal sense. Tried some other quick little examples just taking some of the information that we would have in a computer and just sharing it with the space around us. There's another little example where we want to involve this with a world of IoT. So we basically want to bring the light switches with us. Right? So whether we're standing at a random place in the wall, on, next to a wall or at our desk working, we want those controls with us. We want the interface to follow us without the machine following us. Here's a great one. We're in a public instance. We basically, each of these are sort of almost really brutally coded, so they're not generalized applications yet. We just want to get the interactions down and explore the vocabulary of dealing with space like this. We want that public moment where the bartender throws us a beer, it's too loud for us to talk, and so we're going to take over some of that interaction. But I don't want to do that with a piece of glass. I don't want the delicacy of that glass in the bar or in the kitchen. I want the natural world to be part of my computing moment. We also wanted to figure out how much could we have objects. And we're not Google. We're a small studio. Uh, so we don't have the energy or to create a, a, a vast object library. But we wanted to see what it would be like in terms of the design problem itself 
to recognize a small vocabulary of objects and allow a simple task-based scenario to play out. And so we built a couple of simple tasks. And lastly, the last example I'll show you here is we wanted to take them to start, involve more of a rich moment where the objects and the information aren't just side by side in a very handy way, but in a more fundamental way, helping someone know how to learn how to do something in a physical space. Now, if I can't cut a tomato, come on. <laughs> but I wanted to use you know, some reasonable example. Uh, yeah. So that's two quick examples about using computing in a new way around things and around spaces. I want to talk to you about, to me, the most profound part of this three-piece scenario, and it's about us as people. And this, I spent a lot of time thinking about. And this, the idea, the most central theme here is this idea of the emerging meta-me. And it starts with the basic notion of the immutable real me. Each of us feels, in a simple term, immutable, meaning you know yourself, you are yourself, your, your conscious mind, that's it, right? That's you. There's no other you, there's no other, there's no mistaken uh, nature there. But oddly enough, as immutable as you feel, there's this emerging thing, the digital you, that is becoming much more equivocal, right? Much higher fidelity, and there are people who spend more time with this version of you than the actual version of you. And the sense of that person becomes more and more authentic to them than the sense of you as an analog. And there are people who actually use that to create all kinds of versions of themselves, right? We all do this. And the level of fidelity around this emerging story, I cannot overstate. The level of emerging fidelity around the description of each of us, the amount of data, even one brand alone, Facebook, maintains an immense profile of ourselves. So I wanted to imagine, what is the logical extent of this? Where does this go? What are the implications? And you can see the implications happening, so I want to illustrate those. Because to me, this is the most profound design challenge we will face, we are facing now. These two together become this emergent notion of the meta-me. And what I mean by that is it becomes indistinguishable. The way we think of ourselves, the way we know ourselves, is as that new meta-self, as opposed to this separateness. We become confused by that. Not in a bad way, but in a healthy way that we think of all that our phone can do as, well, part of what we do, right? I, it's, it's the fact that um, I know I can look something up very quickly. I, I don't even know my son's phone number. Uh, I don't think I could dial it directly because I have never had to dial it because my phone knows the number and I just know the name. So boom, there, I'm, I'm good, right? That's a growing symbiosis there, even in that very small example. And you see this emergent reality of decision support starting with just simple things like where, how to drive somewhere. I told you the example of the Uber driver who had essentially lent his decision support capabilities to the mapping application. Well, that is a very real phenomena. And decision support is probably one of the most fundamental design challenges we face because we want to trust in the immutable self, the fact that we are in charge. We're the one driving. We're the one deciding whether to eat that particular dish. But the dependency on the decision matrix in front of us and that growing quality of that decision matrix is growing to where there is a suspicion that people may feel unwilling to contradict what algorithms have to say about them. That to me is as profound as a design challenge as you could imagine for a designer, right? Something that goes true to the heart of who we each are. And even some of the most dramatic questions about ourselves, like how long do we have left? 
become a quantifiable reality. I do believe these things become quantifiable, even if it's not precise. The idea that someone one day will offer this data up, offer this best guess up, and that best guess gets better and better every day, who's not going to look at that? And that leads me to a very fundamental question, this question of trust. And trust is a pretty blunt instrument today, a blunt problem, right? We saw it happen, fuck, I saw it happen in the United States in the worst possible way. <laughs> but it's a pervasive problem globally, clearly. Systems are being exploited to erode the, nat the natural idea that the things you read come from someone and that person exists within the same social order as you do. We have that sort of presumption because you're sitting in a room with somebody and there's only so many things you would expect them to ever do or say. But when digital systems are enjoined, that's no longer true. And we exploit that break. But there's much more smaller, nefarious questions around trust that I think as designers will face as opposed to this brutal, blunt part of it. And that is when systems are giving us advice in all the small, tiny ways that we will continue to enjoy. When they're saying, drive this way to get to the restaurant. When they're saying, drive this way to get to that appointment. And they keep sending you in this funny little route that, where you pass McDonald's. I keep passing McDonald's, how come I do that? There's a quicker route the other way and you just intuit that this isn't the quickest route. Is it because someone needs to make money and someone else is gonna offer up money to send you past that restaurant day after day. It's all those little tiny algorithmic tunes, quirks, exploits that concern me that will be part of the design systems that we increasingly participate in. Another aspect of design that to me is dramatic is this idea of the public sphere. The public sphere right now, I think we exist with implicit trust, right? We can go into a retail store to shop and we feel like we are uh, just one of any number of shoppers. It's probably very fair to say that especially in some countries uh, where you're from, what color you are, your sex, that distorts that opportunity to just be yourself. What to me is really scary is that idea that that could be the reality, not just for people that we hope to evolve out of having that happen to them, but that is a reality instead that happens to everybody, that the public sphere ceases to exist. Sorry, I don't wanna head down a paranoid path. I'm just saying this is a very real fact that the public sphere will eventually disappear. And as designers, how do we allow, how do we design for those public moments uh, such that it's not abused? Because the, the public moment, that the moment where we're standing in the store or protesting a recent decision, a recent political move, we want to be free in that moment. But the systems behind those moments, the systems behind the store, behind that public moment, they will know who we are they will know enough about us. So how do we protect for that? That anonymity won't be the protection anymore. That's what protects us today. It must be things like the law. So I'm gonna head into the last section here and it begins with this idea, it's a very classical idea, the bicameral mind. You guys familiar with this idea? It's really, the bicameral mind is that moment in history when man realized that it wasn't a God talking to himself, but it was just his own inner voice. He was listening to himself. He has his own inner dialogue. Fascinating idea that we are really of two minds, this sort of processing mind and this mind that can narrate to itself. And I imagine all of this change that I'm describing, all of these emergent digital systems that know me, that have a massive data store about me, that the systems out in public are able to track and learn 
all of this about me, can instrument that. And you end up with this world, this possible world, and I think there's some very idealistic opportunities here, that are essentially founded on shared agency. This idea of the meta-me having agency, not simply it's a record of me, but it is a participant actor. It can go off and set up a meeting. It can approve a purchase request in a, in a, in a business context. It is me, not just an agent for me, but it is really as much as my mind is consistent from thought to thought, Ideally, it is as consistent, it is as learned about what I would do as I am inside of my own mind, like the bicameral mind. And it can be employed in creative ways. There's this idea of Cyrano, have you guys familiar with the European, the French play, Cyrano de Bergerac? This is a guy who's incredibly witty with his words. He knows how to woo a woman in this case, in this story, but he's very unattractive. Well, he has this huge nose, and he's, he's embarrassed about it. And there's this other guy, Christian, who's kind of a moron, and he falls in love with Roxanne. Cyrano falls in love with Roxanne. And so they conspire to help Christian woo Roxanne through Cyrano's words. So Cyrano hides in the bushes and tells Christian what to say, and he says it to Roxanne, and Christian sounds awesome, and she falls in love. Of course, Cyrano is very regretful of that eventually. The whole point is this idea of having a third actor in a two-person conversation is an emergent reality. You can bet on that because you see it happening today. Why does the screen keep going off? Uh, you see the fact that you get happy birthday announcements or congratulations on your new job from people you're connected to in LinkedIn. They, didn't they still had to press that button, thank God, Jesus. They didn't necessarily come up with that text. And of course, Google has a beautiful new chat tool that learns what you like to say, triangulates it with what everyone else likes to say, and helps you along. I can imagine a day when maybe there's a go ahead and auto reply on this, and my friend has auto reply on, and our two phones get off talking, and we only find out later that they decided to set up dinner. Uh, <laughs> it's gonna happen, this is my point. Uh, it's very real and we have to trust that it will get it wrong sometimes. This is... Oh, okay, so this is a guy who crashed his car. You know, terrible thing, right? He, he's, he's, he's probably okay, but he had a terrible car crash. And he took pictures of that tar car crash. And Facebook, using its algorithm, created a nice little animation of it with the absolute wrong choice in music. Um, and especially in terms of having a domain over our own decisions. Yes, I love this cartoon. Um, we will find these moments where these systems decide for us, and we only find out after the fact. To me, this is, this is it. This is the most profound avenue for what we do. Designing screens, yes, of course, we'll continue to do that, but that's not really the problem, is it? This idea of the mutable self is truly challenged. At the border, the US border today, they asked to search your phone. And there's a fantastic legal brief now written by a lawyer about how the phone is not yet another thing in your pocket, like a wallet, but instead part of you. And searching it is like searching your mind. And in that sense, you get to plead the fifth. You get to just not say anything. We haven't, of course, that legal case has not gone through. No one's challenged it in that way. But this idea that we have to search your brain is real even today by searching your phone. But eventually, the almost literal notion of we need to search your brain could be there. And because we have these rich, rich digital systems and they increasingly are your brain. So to me, it's a simple fact 
and I just kind of, I like to state this to myself every time I'm designing something or I imagine a possible future, that any aspect of life that can be augmented by computing will be, especially ourselves. And to give you kind of a nice humorous uh, uh, punch to that, to the end, my daughter sort of willingly loves um, at least one aspect of this future. And so I'll show you that clip. Oh, am I gonna get sound here? Okay. This is, this is an interview with her. My name is Annika. What's your favorite thing to eat for dinner? Uh, spaghetti and meatballs. Oh yeah? What are we having tonight? I don't know. Hmm. Would you like ice cream? Yes. She's made it herself. <laughs> All right, thank you guys very much.